and welcome everybody. I want to talk a little bit uh, today, this morning or this afternoon, depending on where you are, about sort of three things, about sort of enterprise agility and then doing agile and being agile. I actually think that enterprise agility is at a similar place today that the agile movement was back in about 2001. And we've kind of reached a tipping point where people are beginning to be more and more interested in agile and adaptive as an organizational capability. So I'm really going to talk about these three things. I want to look a little bit at enterprise agility and what is it and why is it so important and why are some people talking about it. And then primarily from a management or leadership perspective, what are the things that managers and leaders need to do and what are the things that they need to be. But there's a lot of stuff in here that is appropriate for developers or testers or architects or other people too because we sort of have a game plan for agile delivery for all of the things that we need to do in terms of project management uh, and technical practices and those kinds of things for delivery teams. But we don't have that much of a roadmap for managers and leaders, and that's what this is going to be. Unfortunately, in the Agile community, we've sometimes looked at leadership from, from sort of these two perspectives. Uh, number one is don't, mi don't micromanage. Uh, and number two is sort of buy pizza and get out of the way. It's sort of a, a hands-off management approach. But I think that is a disservice. And what we really need to talk about is if we don't want people to micromanage, then what is macromanage? And so we've really got to take a look at really what kinds of things managers and executives can do that I think can greatly enhance the process of moving to an agile organization. One of the things that I'm going to do is talk about several different studies. I'm not going to go into them in any depth, but just to show you that a range of very well-known, very respected organizations have weighed into this agility issue. Uh, this is from The Economist from a couple of years ago, a special report of it on agility. And we're talking here about enterprise or organizational agility, not necessarily IT or software development agility. So nearly 90% of executives cite organizational agility as a key to global success and half think it's not only important, but it's the core differentiator. It's the thing that's going to make a big difference in the world. Interestingly enough, about the same a number of people think uh, that it's key to success, but only about half the people, half the CEOs really think they know how to address uh, some of these issues and how to actually uh, get more agile. Uh, IBM did a uh, study of 1,500. They interviewed 1,500 CEOs last year, put together a very interesting report, and it really confirms those things that we thought about the world being more volatile, more uncertain, uh, but this is from a CEO's perspective, just kind of confirm the kinds of things that we've been talking about in Agile community for quite some time. And so we're really looking at a very turbulent environment. Uh, Don Saul wrote a very interesting book, uh, The Upside of Turbulence. It basically says turbulence can be a good thing or a bad thing. And that, in fact, one of the things we need to do is to exploit uh, the opportunities and take advantage of those changes. So being agile, being adaptive is not just about responding to change, but it's actually driving change. It's being the instigator of change, whether it's new products faster to the marketplace, uh, different kinds of things that we're doing in terms of service that we are actually causing other people, other competitors pain by the kinds of things that we exploit in the business world. So I think agility at its core for a business or for a IT organization is the ability to create and respond to change in order to profit in a turbulent business environment. So it's create change, it's respond to change, and it's in a turbulent environment, I think, are three of the key kinds of things. If you look at business strategy for an organization, for a, a 
product group within the organization, for a functional area within the organization. I think one of the basic determinants of strategy is whether or not we want to look at the responsiveness of the organization or we're really looking at efficiency. We do both to some extent, but one is really the goal and the other one is the constraint. So everybody wants to be efficient, but is that the objective? Is that what you're really driving for? Or is it the constraint? Yes, I want to, my main thrust is to be responsive, and I have to be that within some bounds. Uh, one of the examples of this, or two of the examples of this, is number one is Google. Google obviously is focused on responsiveness, coming out with new products, coming out with new products rapidly, trying a whole range of new products and putting betas out there and, and seeing if they're working uh, and cutting those off that aren't working and, and feeding those that are working. Does Google worry, worry about cost or efficiency? Yeah, to some extent, but only as a constraint on what they're doing, not really as the objective. On the other hand, if you look at Walmart, how do they really make money? What is their overall business strategy? It really is efficiency, efficiency, efficiency. So they can be the lowest cost uh, to the consumer. Uh, one of the interesting data points uh, over the last 10 years if I, as I've gone to many Agile conferences, I've seen a lot of Google people. I've never in 10 years until the last Agile conference, seen anybody from Walmart. And at the last conference, I did find it, there was an executive from Walmart there. But by and large, they're a very, still a very efficiency based and efficiency oriented kind of organization. I like this quote by Seth Godin There are only two choices win by being more ordinary, more standard, and cheaper, or win by being faster, more remarkable, and more human. And both of those will work. You can win by being low cost. Walmart has shown that. You can win by being faster and more remarkable. Where you can't win is being in the middle. Where you can't win is trying to do both. And so as you look at your business unit, your company, you really need to be looking at which of these is the driver and which of these is the constraint. Um, Another study that was done by MIT a few years ago, and really looking at business agility as opposed to IT agility, although IT is part of that, uh, that the businesses they looked at had a 29% higher earnings per share. That's quite a number, and I don't know exactly how they calculated that, but uh, uh, MIT Sloan School of Management is a pretty respected organization in terms of their research. And you see things happening in the marketplace today. There are a lot of things that are sort of tangential to the Agile movement that are going on in the sort of leadership and management space. And, and they really kind of break down to three. One is a movement that came out of primarily finance and accounting called Beyond Budgeting, but has gotten a lot of play in management groups. Uh, one of the newer books in that area is something called The Leader's Dilemma. Uh, the, lean, the lean movement, particularly including the lean startup movement, has generated a lot of interest over the last couple of years. And then there's a category that I'll just call next generation management. Things like leadership agility from Bill Joyner uh, and radical management from Stephen Denny. So there are a lot of things going on in this space in terms of new ways to approach uh, the, the problems of turbulence uncertainty and ambiguity in our business environments. Well, let me sit back just a minute and give you an example. Uh, I've worked a lot with Pat Reed, who is a director at The Gap, and she basically gave this presentation a couple of years ago. Um, and at, a, at an Agile conference. And a couple of years ago in 2008, uh, The Gap took on a new brand, the Athleta brand, which was high-end for uh, high-end sportswear for women. And so one of the things they did is they needed to get this online division up and running fairly fast, and they did. It was completely online version, and it got up and got running, and, and uh, it was a success. And then what they started hearing from some of their 
customers were that they really wanted to see these uh, clothes in a store. And so they decided to do a pilot to see if this Athleta brand would work in a store as opposed to just online. And so they went to the brick and mortar people within the organization and they said, you know, we'd like to do a pilot store hall. What would it take? Well, the brick and mortar people, their task is to be efficient. Their task is to put in the 104th store in a chain. They are not set up to do the first store in a pilot. And so what happened was that the online division, because they were fairly entrepreneurial, they were fairly adaptive, uh, they got the job of putting this new store in. And they cut a few corners, for example. Uh, they, they rented out space up in Marion County. Uh, they didn't hook up to the standard accounting systems within the company. They used QuickBooks and some other things to sort of get up and running. And in a fourth of the time that it would have taken them to build a brick and mortar store, but it was enabled them to demonstrate on a pilot basis that this worked. And then they went on to develop more stores. So this is a, this is a place where responsiveness and doing things uh, fairly quickly or more quickly was uh, really important. In terms of doing things more quickly, uh, one of the things that is given a lot of play today is this thing called continuous delivery and continuous deployment. And this is from a uh, screenshot from uh, Flickr, which was Flickr was last deployed 26 minutes ago, including changes by eight changes by three people. In the last week, there were 47 deploys of 364 changes by 19 people. And so we now have the ability to do kind of continuous deployment. And Flickr really steps up and says, hey, this is, this is really something that's important to us, and we're going to tell you all about it. But for a lot of businesses, one of the things that we have to do is we have to look and see, okay, will things like continuous delivery and continuous deployment is that a business uh, objective that we want to go for? It can have some strategic impact on our business, but it also requires us to do some things at a business level that we, you know, may not be doing right now. If I look at the development of the Agile movement over time, uh, the strategic impact, we really started with sort of iterative development and, you know, we did iterations, we did a few stories, we did some retrospectives, we did stand-ups, uh, we did a little bit of automated testing, we may have done some refactoring. So we, we, we started down that path and even though uh, some things in extreme programming talked about continuous integration even early on, it sort of was the second level when we started really thinking more seriously about continuous integration. And my checkpoint for are we really doing continuous integration is really do we have comprehensive automated tests? And I think that's an important checkpoint. So, for example, uh, Steve Green at Salesforce.com talked at the last Agile conference about their build pipeline, and they have over 100,000 automated tests in their build pipeline. That's doing continuous integration. And then the next stage is really continuous delivery and continuous deployment. It's going that last mile to, to the point where we could deploy on a, on a very regular, if not continuous basis, but that would be based on the business need. What happens as you move from the left to the right on this x-axis is you go beyond just the delivery teams. You engage product management more and more as we found. You, in, you have to engage uh, computer operations and they're really looking at things in a much different way. And so in order to do continuous deployment, you have to do a different kind of relationship between development and operations. So what happens is that you really have to go up on the y-axis. You actually have to get more of the organization that is adaptable and agile. You have to sort of move from Agile 101, which are kind of the basics of Agile, to kind of a sustainable Agile. You have to get more people in the organization 
kind of bought into agility and responsiveness and these kinds of things. And so in order to do a good job of continuous delivery, continuous deployment, you have to engage a lot more of the organization and a lot more of the management because you really have to have the business rationale for moving in and doing that. And we really end up asking two key strategic questions in our businesses. Number one is, in what ways does our business need to be more responsive? So you ask that from a business perspective. How do we need to be more responsive? And then secondly, you ask it from a capability perspective. Okay, we have the capability of delivering much faster and deploying much faster. How could we take advantage of that from a business perspective? And both of those are important. And they also lead us to the ideas about we really have to look at what level of agility do we really want to engage in? A lot of organizations look at Agile as a software engineering, software development discipline, and really not very much in terms of this is a way that we have to manage differently or this is a way that we have to run our organization differently. It really is focused at an operational level. And that's fine, but I think you get a lot more advantage if you particularly are an organization that needs to be much more responsive if you take a look at it from a strategic level, from an organizational level, uh, even to the point, for example, that you might have a chief agility officer, somebody who's really looking at how can we become more agile in our business overall and how does agile software development kind of contribute to that. And there are a number of organizations around the world that have been involved in doing this. I mentioned Salesforce.com uh, that really has been at the forefront, both from an IT uh, product development and from a business perspective. Uh, people like Suncorp in Australia, New Zealand, and Capital One. So there are organizations that have begun moving this in this direction in a very uh, concerted way. So that's really enterprise agility in terms of what could it potentially do for us and why it might be important. Uh, the next level is really the do and the be agile. It's really in two parts, the different things that we have to do and then the different things that we have to be. One of the things that I think is important here is that the agile uh, initiatives in many of our companies have asked developers and testers and architects and product owners to do things that are very different. They, we've asked developers to do things like more automated unit testing. We've asked them to do things like refactoring. In many of our organizations, we've asked them to sit down together and do pair programming. We've asked them to be co-located in, in one location around uh, a, a large desk so that we can, they can collaborate and communicate with each other. We've asked testers to do more automated acceptance testing and to integrate testing back into the life cycle. Those are really hard things. They're, they're new technical things to learn and they're new ways of being in a team and being co a collaboration and being a self-organizing team. So they're different ways of operating that we've asked people to be. I think that we need to ask management and executives to do equally hard things. And so some of the things I'm going to talk about in the next few minutes are hard. I'm not saying that they're easy, but I think they are a challenge to executives and leaders to do things in a different way. And they're really, this is, this is the overall both being and doing. And so I want to f focus first on the, the doing side, the, So if you look at it, I think that there are you know, business goals and objectives, um, profitability, market share, customer satisfaction, those kinds of things. And then there's product delivery. This is Agile, Lean, Kanban, Scrum, XP, all those kinds of things that are involved in product delivery. But I think there's some critical levers in the middle that link the business goals to product delivery. And these are some places where management can have an enormous impact on the outcome. And these are the four that I'm going to talk about. 
this idea of doing less, and that's really hard for some people. They think, no, no, we don't want to do less. We want to do more. Uh, <laughs> um, this idea of, particularly in software, around quality and why quality is so very important to success. The idea of speeding up the delivery of value. And I'm going to tie that closely to the do less kind of thing. And then finally, if we want to really transform our organization to enterprise agility, we have to engage staffs and we have to look at motivation and engagement and inspiration in somewhat of a different way. So I first want to take a look at, at quality. And, you know, we think a lot of times that uh, it's the engineers and the testers who are uh, really responsible for quality. And, and that is true to a certain extent. But I have seen many organizations where management had a tremendous impact on quality. So, for example, I know of one organization that uh, implemented Scrum, and one of the reasons they implemented it was to improve quality. And then at a management level, all they looked at was velocity. They, they never really looked at quality until, you know, the end of the month or the end of the quarter. Uh, and so it wasn't really a day-to-day -day kind of thing. We've seen uh, projects where we actually were monitoring the code and doing code measurements. We've seen situations where a new manager would come in and the code quality would decrease because that manager would emphasize different things. And so management has a tremendous impact on quality, particularly on things like reducing technical debt. And I'll get to that in a few minutes. Several years ago, Michael Ma and I did a study of one of our clients. Michael is with QSM Associates. Uh, many of you may have seen presentations he's given. He's sort of the agile metrics guru. And this was from a scientific instrument company in Canada. And we did, we looked at six projects sort of pre-agile and six projects during and after agile. And this was the accumulation of the results. And so we looked at projects versus each other. And we also looked at the projects versus uh, Michael's database of 7,500 projects. And what we saw was tremendous improvement in cost and in schedule and reducing in staffing. But the thing that really drove that, and this has been proven again and again in different metric studies, going back to Capers Jones's work in the early 1990s, is the reduction of cumulative defects. And in this particular case, they had an 83% improvement in defect levels. They went from four times the industry average to a half the industry average in defects uh, over, over this transition period. One of the things that, that I think uh, managers and leaders uh, need to understand about software development in particular is if you focus on quality, you will get speed and you will get lower cost. If you focus on speed, you will probably not get either speed or quality. And so this focal point has got to be uh, really important. Uh, and it's not just about uh, developers and testers uh, being perfectionists. It's really about some important things related to the overall quality of products and, and also at a technical debt level. And this is one of the other big things that we get into this vicious cycle of is what's more important, fixing a little bit of technical debt or delivering the next features. And so we always say, okay, we'll deliver the next feature. And so what happens over time is the responsiveness to customer goes down significantly. And even over short periods of time, iteration to iteration, this delivery speed goes down. And so what happens is delivery speed goes down, responsiveness goes down, technical debt goes up, the pressure to do more goes up because we the customers say, well, geez, you know, we just asked for something little. Why is it going to take four months? And so it's the pressure to do the next thing in a kind of a haphazard way, too. And it just gets worse and worse. And so companies get into uh, high levels of technical debt. And it's very difficult to get out because it's expensive. And it also takes a real discipline to get out of high technical debt situations. So one of the things that companies really need is they really need a technical 
debt reduction and prevention strategy uh, as a part of what they're doing and, and an investment in that. And in the last couple of years in particular, there have been tools that have come out, uh, tools like Sonar, which is an open source tool, to actually help us begin measuring the, the technical debt in, in some of our products, which has been a real help. So we want to also look at speed to value. Uh, one of the things about Agile, and particularly when we get in continuous delivery and continuous deployment, is from inception to actually delivering the value, we want to cut that period of time shorter and shorter so that we're not just releasing a product once a year or once every 18 months, but maybe much, much more frequently than that. Now, that varies a lot from product to product in terms of actual deployment. Some products, web-based products, we may deploy multiple times per day, but that capability is helping us create value more quickly. And I think this is a really important thing. Obviously, this was part of the IBM study uh, that emphasized that also, the ability to execute with speed. But I want to take a look at the other side of this equation for just a minute. I want to take a look at the value side because I think this is equally important in terms of speed. So the traditional iron triangle of cost, schedule, and scope is something we've managed projects to for a long, long time. But if we're really saying to people, yes, we want you to be adaptable as things change, as the project goes on and you learn more uh, about things and the customer changes their mind. We want you to have the ability to change and adapt and be flexible. That doesn't stand up very well in a constraint-driven constraint environment where we're really looking at cost schedule and some sort of requirements or fixed scope. I think the first thing we have to look at is is what we're delivering something that's of value to the customer, number one. And how one of the ways we measure that is, do we have a releasable product? Do we have something that we can deliver to the customer and the customer says, this is okay? That doesn't mean that we've done all of the detail requirements. In fact, there's some of the scope that we may not do. We may have a completely releasable product without doing the complete range of requirements, but we ought to always be asking the question to our customers, is this enough? Have we done enough? Can we release this product? Because if we can release this product early, we can begin delivering the value and receiving the value. Secondly, the old iron triangle didn't have quality in it. And people would say, well, quality is in scope or quality is in the middle. And in most cases, it was just quality wasn't there. Um, and so Quality is really about being, one, reliable, which is the ability to deliver today and get what you want out of an application today. And the second one is really adaptability. Will this application adapt to the future? And so I have proposed this sort of agile triangle as a different way of looking at progress and performance in an agile world and it really also impacts uh, the speed to value kind of thing. The next one I want to look at is really this whole idea of do less and again this is this is really kind of a, an outgrowth of the simplicity piece of agile development. But I had a friend of mine, Paul Young, who was a CIO at a company up in Canada a few years ago and they were doing a CRM system, a customer relationship management system for their marketing and sales department. And the marketing and sales department basically came in and said, here's 100 features that we want. And Paul says, fine, uh, we'll give you all 100 features, but we'd like to start with the top three. And they said, no, 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 you know, we, we want all 100. And Paul says, fine, we're going to give you all 100. What are your top three? So they gave him the top three. They delivered the top three. They began using them a little bit. Um, and they went to the next three. And they had the same argument about, yeah, we need all 100. And he said, yes, but what are the top three? When they got to about 20, they went back to the client one more time and said, okay, what are your next three? And the client said, that's enough. And he said, well, what about the other 80? And the client said, well, you know, they'd be kind of nice to have, but we've gotten 80% of the benefit uh, out of what we proposed in the beginning, and uh, we're, we're okay. We would just like to stop now, and we might come back later. 
And, and as Paul said, if you'd done the more traditional upfront requirements, write a big requirements document, you would have done all 100 features uh, and you'd have been like throwing money away. So when I talk about doing the simplest thing possible and about doing less, in some ways I want to increase throughput. So one of the things in terms of doing less that we won't talk about much is reducing work in process. Some of the things that the lean and the Kanban people talk about. We want to increase innovation. We want to increase the quality. We want to increase the value delivered to the customer from an overall portfolio of projects. So let me look at this thing a little bit different way. There's several studies that have been done over the last 10 years that basically say more than 50%, in some cases significantly more than 50% of the, pro the products, the software that is out there has functions and, and code that are never or rarely used. And everybody says, well, you know, of course, that's not my code. That's somebody else's code. But just think, uh, D. Hock was the CEO of Visa International for a number of years, and he kind of coined a management style he called chaotic management, balanced on the precipice between chaos and order. And he had these two quotes that I think sort of, for me, epitomize uh, agility, adaptive management. Simple, clear purpose and principles Give, lie, give rise to complex, intelligent behavior. Complex rules and regulations give rise to simple, stupid behavior. And so it's really the agile adaptive manager is really all about simple, clear purpose and principles and, and letting people go and engaging them in complex, intelligent behavior. So I'm really trying, we're trying to move uh, from sort of this command control kind of management that we've seen in the past, and we're making the transition to adaptive leadership. Some people call it management 2.0. Denning calls it radical management. Uh, Jurgen Apollo calls it management 3.0. There are a bunch of different names for this, but it's a different new style of management that people are trying out, trying to figure out which way to go and how to do this. There are a lot of aspects of this, but I think there are four kind of critical ones that I'll talk about, and then I'll leave it open for some questions. Uh, this idea of an adaptive mindset, exploring, facilitating, and writing paradox. So number one is really adapting. A traditional manager focuses on following the plan with minimal changes, whereas an agile leader focuses on adapting successful to inevitable changes. So it's a different mindset, really, about how you look and view change. Uh, one way you can see that, for example, is looking at the issue of are you predictable or are you adaptable? Uh, and so the product development schedule at the top really is focused on time and activities, the traditional Gantt chart, whereas the parking lot diagram developed by Jeff DeLuca at the bottom is really looking at the, pro the, the progress from a different perspective. It's really looking at it from a perspective of the value in each of these epics or capabilities that are deployed here. And so when you talk about adapting, what you're doing is you, rather than moving activities around on a Gantt chart, you're looking at the value in each of these boxes and the customers are saying one of these boxes is more important than the other box and we need to add some to one and take away from the other. So you're trying to look at this at a, at, from a value perspective, even down at the level of stories. So again, it's a different way of, of looking at adjusting. And then the other thing we need to be more adaptive is we need better tools. Uh, I'm not going to go into these right now in any detail. There's a, a white paper that you can read to go over these. But we really need to do at least four things to adapt. We need to have a way of showing what's important. We need to have a way of compressing the time frame in which we're looking at things. We need to have a, uh, a better handle on decision making and how we make decisions, how we make decisions as an organization, as a collaborative team, and how we do that more quickly and more effectively. And then finally, we have to have a change model that, that we all sort of use. One of the big organizations that went through an agile uh, adoption process found out that they were using 17 different change models in their organization. And so they had to re refocus on just one of those. A second piece of an agile mindset is really this idea of exploring. 
This is really difficult. It sounds easy, but it's really difficult for a lot of people because they have what I call a plan-do mindset. We plan it up front. We feel we're in control and safe because we've got this uh, detailed plan, and then we just execute the plan. We just do the plan, as opposed to an agile environment where we really have an envision of where we want to go, and then we explore into that vision. So it's a, it's a vision explorer rather than plan do. And one of the interesting things about this is it sets up a very different monitoring dynamic for management that's very hard because a lot of traditional projects, people are very confident in the outcome up front because they've got this big, long, detailed plan. But as things goes on, go along, they sort of lose confidence. What happens in an Agile project is a lot of times we have less confidence up front because we don't have this detailed plan. But as we begin delivering software on a regular basis, people actually gain more confidence as we go through the project. But it's a very, it's a very different kind of uh, experience for a lot of managers. We want to talk about facilitative managing. Uh, of facilitating self-organizing teams, of facilitating interaction, of facilitating collaboration. But I don't want to focus on that part of it, the connect part of it right now. There's another piece of it that often gets ignored, and that's the clarify piece, that a lot of Agile projects and a lot of uh, organizations have a lot of uncertainty, ambiguity, and speed. And so one of the things that leaders are called on to do from time to time is to clarify, is to focus, is to make occasionally some of the hard decisions that need to be made, but in particular to help people focus on those things that's, that are really important. It's really hard for a dev team to do less unless the management is really saying, here are the things that are most important and here are the areas in which you really need to focus on doing less. And so that's really part and parcel of management. And then finally, this idea of, of writing paradox, of what I call and management, not or management. There are some issues that there's just no black and white answer to. So, for example, the one I brought up a little earlier about predicting versus adapting. It's not one or the other. You've got to learn how to do both. You've got to learn in an agile environment how to be both predictable and adaptable. But we may redefine what we mean by predictable and how we intend to be predictable. So for one thing, uh, for example, a lot of agile organizations have gone to this release train sort of approach where they actually have fixed deadlines for delivering uh, and, and the product is going to go out at those deadlines uh, and features may get on the, the release train or not. Uh, but the train is going out of the station. And so we've got a very predictable cycle time that's based on time and some flexibility around um, the features. And that's the kind of thing where we, we're doing both. We allow adaptability and also predictability. Uh, this is oftentimes a very difficult place to be. And, and we can see the manager on this horse uh, it is really sort of exposed. Uh, and because in a lot of organizations, for example, it's okay to be wrong, uh, but it's not okay to be uncertain. Um, the other thing is, in order to be able to ride paradox, we have to move beyond the rule-based approach to Agile. Agile 101 is essential to learning. You have to learn the rules. You have to learn the basics. You can, you can't, you can, you can't. But in order to be an and manager, in order to be a mature Agile organization, you've got to move beyond the rules. And this is a place that I find a lot of people uh, fall down. They don't move beyond the rule base. And you can look at this picture on the left, for example, was Picasso in his early years, where he followed the rules of painting. And the paintings were very straightforward. And then he learned how to, to bend and break the rules beyond to move beyond painting 101 to mature painting and so this is sort of the, the later version of Picasso's stuff. And so we started with this idea of enterprise agility driven by a look at whether we wanted to be uh, efficient or responsive 
uh, we took a look at things like the strategic impact of moving along the agile continuum towards continuous delivery and the fact that we had to be more adaptive, more agile in order to do that. And then we looked at the things in terms of doing and being agile. If you'd like some additional information, there is a white paper on the ThoughtWorks site. Uh, there's also my blog, and also you can uh, find me on Twitter.